come to my assistance. The Lord make haste to help me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Lord has sworn an oath he will not change, 
have approached Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and countless angels in the festal gathering, and the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and God the judge of all, and the spirits of the just made perfect, and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. Et te 
Rejoicing in the Lord, from whom all good things come, let us pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Father and Lord of all, you sent your Son into the world, that your name might be glorified in every place. Strengthen the witness of your church among the nations. Lord, hear our prayer. Make us obedient to the teachings of your Apostle and bound to the truth of our faith. Lord, hear our prayer. As you love the innocent, render justice to those who are wronged. Lord, hear our prayer. Free those in bondage and give sight to the blind. Raise up the fallen and protect the stranger. Lord, hear our prayer. Fulfill your promise to those who already sleep in your peace. Through your Son, grant them a blessed resurrection. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray with confidence in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Almighty God, our Creator and Guide, may we serve you with all our heart and know your forgiveness in our lives. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord.
Well, welcome everyone to uh, Lecture Divina, the evening prayer and Lecture Divina for this year. And uh, during this year, I'll be uh, leading meditation on various psalms. And uh, I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, of course, the psalms are a very important part of the divine office or the prayer that is prayer prayed by priests, by bishops, by deacons, religious sisters, and by many lay people as well. It is the daily prayer of the church and is very, very beautiful. The psalms themselves speak to us of the struggles of life, the joys of life, the anxieties we face, the dangers we face, what it means to be facing sickness and, and care and worry and concern. It strikes me that those are always important things to reflect upon. And the Psalms are powerful prayers in times of, of great need. But in a very special way, perhaps, it's appropriate, as we're all facing various uh, struggles and trials in this time of the pandemic, to go to the Psalms, to find in them the way in which we can draw closer to God and the way in which we can navigate through, with God's help, the various storms in which we find ourselves in these days. And so the meditations this term, this year, will be on the Psalms, maybe next year as well. They're so powerful. Many years ago, when I was first ordained, I'd, um, my bishop sent me, first of all, put me in a parish for a while to serve the people there, teach in a high school for a while. And then he sent me over to Rome to study at the Pontifical Biblical Institute, where I, I did uh, a licentiate in sacred scripture. And about a year or two after that, when I had only been ordained about five years or so, uh, I was asked by a bishop, uh, but the, the Archbishop of Regina, Saskatchewan, to do a retreat for his priests. And said I to myself, well, what do I know in very short, little experience as a priest? What could I offer to these pastors who'd been there in Western Canada serving the people for many, many, many years? What do I have I could offer to them? I certainly couldn't offer experience or pastoral guidance. But I had studied as a university student, I studied English literature. I got an MA in English. And I also had a licentiate in scripture. And so I thought, well, you know, poetry is something that I, I'm very engaged in. And I have been praying the divine office for many years, which is made up mostly of poetry, it's the Psalms. And I realized that the Psalms, these prayers, these songs, these hymns of the Old Testament are often a little strange. They seem difficult at times. You have like, harden not your heart as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the desert. What on earth does that mean? People would wonder what that means. And so because I realized that people sometimes, especially priests who are promised that their ordination as deacons, to pray the divine office every day for the rest of their lives for the people they serve, that I might be able to help the priests to pray the psalms of the divine office. And that might help them to strengthen their life in prayer and be better priests and be able to help the people more by praying for them, which is the most important thing we do for one another. And so, I've been doing that for the last 40 years, <laughs> all over the place. I built up a little pile of handouts, which I can also make available for everyone. Um, I've been doing it for a long, long time. And I found it a great grace in my own life, because when you share something and you go deeper trying to understand something beautiful and important, you help yourself, obviously, as well. So I've been deeply appreciative of that, because I myself pray the Divine Office every single day. And I have been since, uh, while well, I've been a priest, 47 years, I began, well, I promised to do this when I was a deacon on May the 14th, 1972, when I knelt in front of Bishop Paul Redding in St. Eugene's Parish in Hamilton and was ordained a deacon. I promised to do it for the rest of my life then, and I've really been doing it for many years before. So we'll start with a show and tell. The divine office is this prayer that goes way, way, way back. Many religions have uh, prayers throughout the course of the day. Muslims do that, Jews do that, many different religions do. And the Christian people have done it from the very earliest days. You notice, for example, well, St. Peter on the roof praying midday prayer of the Jewish tradition. Notice the different ways in which 
the Psalms, which are found in much of the Jewish prayer, found their way into the life of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying ad living a prayer to the Heavenly Father. But on the cross, he prayed a psalm, and that should teach us about the importance of the psalms, which are the main content of the divine office. It's sometimes called the Liturgy of the Hours, because it's meant to go throughout time. It's making time sacred, and our lives are made up of time. That's the fabric of our lives. And so it is, if the, the monks do this uh, in monasteries, I usually go for a retreat when I can get across the border, which I can't these days. I go to the monastery of Genesee, a wonderful Trappist monastery. And there they have the first office of the divine office is at 2.30 in the morning, which is always very bracing and exciting in the early morning. And that's when they, they pray, they have a hymn, some psalms, a reading from the scriptures, and a reading from the spiritual tradition of the church. This is called, for the rest of us who are not monks, is called the office of readings. And I usually pray it when I first get up. I get up pretty early, I'm an early bird. Ever since I delivered the Globe and Mail as a high school student, I get up quite early, around 5, 15 or so. And I go down and make a pot of coffee, which is required for prayer, I think, according to Bishop Sheen. Uh, have a little bowl of cereal, then I go up and begin my holy hour. And what I do is I start with the office of reading. So it's some psalms, a reading from scripture, and a reading from the tradition of the church. And then I pray morning prayer, which is very often prayed by people in church. A hymn, some psalms, two psalms, and also some spiritual song that's not in the book of psalms. There are 150 hymns called the psalms, but throughout the Old Testament, there are things called canticles, which are basically psalms that are not in the book of psalms. So they have two psalms, a canticle, a little reading of scripture, a little response. It's just what we did just now, actually. It's evening prayer. And then another canticle every day at the beginning of the day is the Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. And then a few little prayers, the Our Father, and then a little prayer in the end. If you are a monk, you then do uh, terse, sex, known, you do the middle, mid-morning, mid-day, mid... The rest of us who are not monks just have what we call... We can do all three midday, midday prayers, but mostly we just do one of them. That's called the midday. They're just a little short psalm or two, a little short reading, and that's it. It's very, very quick. In the evening, people from ancient times have been praying Vespers, and we did just now. It's best when you do it in a community like this. It's wonderful. But if you're not, you, you do it out of the, 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 the breviary of the book of the divine office. So as we have just seen, we have prayed that. It's, will God come to my assistance? O Lord, make haste to help me. Then a hymn, some psalms, and this time the canticle is from the New Testament. And then we had one from the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse. A reading, a response, the canticle of Magnificat, which was sung in the beautiful Latin. We chanted that as I went around incensing the altar. And then we have some more prayers for the people, the Our Father, a little closing prayer, a blessing, and that's it. So we've just prayed the evening prayer. And we do that uh, every time we have Lectio Divina. The final office, the final hour, is called Compline, or night prayer. And it's very short, so short you can memorize it. Uh, there is one for seven days of the week, but some people just memorize the one for Sunday. And uh, it is a little introduction, an examination of conscience, and then a little psalm or two, a little hymn, a psalm, a little brief reading. And the canticle is, Now, Lord, dismiss your servant in peace. The canticle of Simeon, a little short prayer. And then we end off today with a, a, something, a song to Our Lady, as we did the Regina Chaley at the end of evening prayer. That's why at the funeral of a priest, the first, the la just before they roll the coffin down the, the aisle, we sing usually the Salve Regina. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. And then once you finish the hymn to Our Lady, click out the light, go to bed, put it all in the hands of the Lord. So this is something monks pray through the night, priests, sisters, deacons, Many lay people pray at different stages. We can take or pick from what is there. Um, you don't need to pray the whole of it. You can pray some of it, a bit of it, a lot of it, whatever. It's beautiful. 
and I highly recommend it. And so one of the reasons I'm going to be meditating upon the Psalms is to help people be encouraged to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. Now, where do we find the Liturgy of the Hours? You know, all kinds of different ways. And I just give you a little show and tell here. Sometimes it is found you can have four volumes like this. This is three of them, but I have my other ones upstairs in my briefery. This is the four of these and one for each season of the year. And that has everything in it. It's got the Office of Readings, all the Scripture readings, everything. So you have this. This is called the Breviary. Then there is a, a little one here that puts all of it together in one book, not four books. All it leaves out is the text of Scripture, but you can get a Bible for that, and the Scripture, the readings of uh, the spiritual read writings of the Church. But you can find that elsewhere. So this actually gives you the whole thing, except if you have to have a Bible with it. If your eyes are going on you, which I find <laughs> as I am, this is the breviary I use in the morning, uh, often it's big print. It's just the same thing. There are four volumes of this. This is the full breviary, but big print. You might want to have a little one for morning prayer and evening prayer and night prayer. Just those parts. Those are the basic parts of the divine office. You can get it like this, and if your eyes are a bit weak, you can get it in a bigger print. So this might be useful. There's another breviary. <laughs> um, the breviary I use much of the time is here, actually, because you can get it on uh, your cell phone or your tablet. The two that are most commonly used are iBreviary and Universalis. They're both very good. Uh, I well use them both, and um, it's just very easy. You just flip it on, go like that, and you pray it. And I find the benefit with my eyes is you can make a bigger print. So there you go. This is actually a lot of. I'm afraid most of us priests probably pray the office on our. We don't. It's easier than carrying the books around. But actually, I'm trying to get away from this back to the books because it seems a bit more humane to do it that way. Um, the psalms that are used. Um, and here's prayer during the day. You can put it in your pocket for prayer during the day. There are the translation being used. The tonight I've been generally using for for its lecture divina, the um, the Revised Standard Version, not the new Revised Standard Version, which we use for the lectionary, but just the old-fashioned Revised Standard Version. I think that's the best, personally, my own personal opinion. Uh, I think um, anyway. There we are. That's what I usually use. But I think later on I'm going to be using more a thing called the Grail Psalms. Those are the ones used in the breviary. They're really, really good. They have a beautiful poetic rhythm to them. They can be chanted. They're wonderful. The ones we prayed tonight were the Grail Psalms. It's a special translation of the Psalms. And uh, you can get a... This is my favorite. This is a new... I have an old version of this that's falling apart. And I put all my notes in it. So I'm going to put my notes into this one because it's, it's, it isn't falling apart. It's just called the Grail Psalms, and I recommend it. This is a little book called The School of Prayer by John Brooke, and it, it comments. It's a little spiritual guide to the divine office, and there's a commentary on the Psalms. Okay, so that's my show and tell for the office, and I, I will, from there now, go on to praying, talking a bit about the Psalms, and then we'll pray Psalm 95. At the beginning of each day, we pray what's called the Invitatory Psalm. Uh, and uh, it is the Invitation Psalm. It's the introductory psalm for the day, and there are different ones that are used. But the one that is used most commonly is Psalm 95. And that's what I like to, to pray together this evening, Psalm 95. It is so beautiful. It's a perfect psalm to begin the day. It's a bit like Psalm 50 and Psalm 81. They're similar to it, so you might want to look look them as well. It's just beautiful. Uh, it starts off with worship, praise. And watch as we pray this, the titles of God. Always watch and praying the psalm. King, rock, shepherd, creator. Just always watch the flashing the titles of God that show us more and more how we encounter God in our lives. It starts with great joy, and then it's, there's, it starts with an exclamation point, 
Come bring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks with songs. Let us hail the Lord. Enthusiasm, <laughs> which we should have. We don't want to be blah. But then why are we enthusiastic in our faith? Because of the fact of God. Our faith is not generated from emotion or enthusiasm. The enthusiasm flows from the fact. A mighty God is the Lord, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his. It's the fact of God that's the heart of our life. And all the rejoicing sort of flows from it. The fact of our faith is like the nugget at the front of a comet, and all the bright streaming after it only comes out of that big hard rock at the front. It's got to be there. That's why doctrine is essential. We're not all about so how do you feel about things. That comes and goes like the weather. You don't live with that. It's the reality as, as uh, John Henry Newman said, religion without doctrine is like filial love without a father. And so we have, so the center, then you have, uh, mighty God is the Lord, a great king. Then come, ring out our joy. He goes into another enthusiastic burst of praise. Then shift gears, like that. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the desert. Meribah and Massa were where the Moses was whacking the rock. He didn't trust. He kept hammering away because he didn't trust God would provide. Do not harden your hearts as at the day of Massa, the testing, or Meribah, contention. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, the day at Mass in the desert, when your fathers put me to the test, when they tried me, though they saw my works. For forty years I was weary to these people, and I said their hearts are astray. These people do not know my ways. And then I uttered an oath in my anger, never shall they enter my rest. The rest of God. It's the promised land, as he's talking about. They didn't make it to the promised land because he would not trust in God. Never shall they enter my rest. Harden not your hearts. And that's how we begin the day. <laughs> so a burst of praise, it's true exuberant, extravagant praise. But then live it. You know, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> no, it's where the rubber hits the road. These are all images that are not used, fortunately, in the Psalms. But that's the point. Don't tell me, I love you, Lord, I love you. Go well, do that, yeah, but, but you better, don't harden your heart, let's obey. Listen to his voice. That's what we need to do as well. And that's the message given to everyone who begins the divine office. Let us give our lives an extravagant worship. But then, and that worship is based upon the fact of God's presence. And then obey him, live accordingly. Remember, we praise God in the imperative, but God lives in the indicative, what is. Not the exclamation point, but the period. He is there. That's why I'm always suspicious of religion that's made up simply of, of pumped up stuff that always has to flow from something more solid. Anyway, that's a little introduction to Psalm 95, which is the introduction to the divine office. Uh, o Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. So let's now enter into a little prayer of that, and I'll use, tonight I will use the, uh, let me use both any, actually. I'll use the uh, Revised Standard Version, because I think that's what people have, and that's what I usually use. And it will be a little odd for me, because what I just prayed you there is what I've done for many years, as you can tell, I have it memorized. Um, but I've been praying it for many years aloud. By the way, pray the Psalms aloud if possible. There used to be a rule that priests, when they pray the divine office, have to move their lips. And that makes sense, because you don't want to speed read the Word of God. That's one reason why doing it from an iPhone is not so smart. You end up just zipping through. Let's slow down. And so pray the Psalms aloud if possible. You may need to turn off the sound if somebody's nearby, but at least pray it, kind of don't speed read anything. That's why we pray it in chant it back and forth. Okay, let's start the divine. <laughs> this is a bit of a lengthy introduction. We'll, we'll pray now Psalm 95. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to fill our hearts with your love. May we open our hearts to you. Forgive us our sins, which are a barrier, which block the pathway to our hearts. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, for his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts, as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the desert, when your fathers tested me, when they put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I was wearied of that generation and said, They are a people who err in heart. They do not regard my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger that they should not enter my rest. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Our faith is exuberant. Not that we always have to be kind of pumped up with the artificial means of music and drums and things like that. That's not religion. But it is joyful. It's super abundant. It's extravagant. Come, let us worship the Lord. We're not to dip our toe into the reality of God's presence. We're to give ourselves completely to the Lord. And in that we find our joy in this life, not a superficial happiness, not an optimism, but the joy even in the midst of suffering. For whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless him still. It is that profound joy rooted in the presence of God that must be who we are. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. He is our rock, not sand. When people try to take religion, take the faith, take the Catholic faith, and dumb it down so that the people will come through the doors to make God a reflection of the latest opinion poll, it is profoundly foolish. I mean, sometimes whole gatherings of ecclesiastics get together to see if they can do that, lure the people back by seeing how we can fit into the shape-shifting world of the zeitgeist. That is foolish beyond belief. It doesn't work, among other things. The church is empty at a faster pace. But it's just not who we are. He is the rock of our salvation. And a house built upon rock will survive, as the Lord says in the Gospel of Matthew. It will, will be there. But a house built upon the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, the sand, will crash down. Look at all the religions that have gone that way. That must not be the path we follow, but different parts of the church can do that. It's happened over time. The, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but they, they sometimes do prevail against the peace of the church when the people abandon the faith or when the leadership of the church tries to sort of dumb it down so that it makes it popular. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's think of that in our own life, too. 
The Lord is our rock, solid. That's what Jesus called Simon, rock, rocky, I'm building the church on you. Not jello, rock. And so our faith shapes us. We don't shape our faith. If we do, we got a pretty pitiful thing. Our, our faith resists our own ego. It shapes us. It is the rock upon which we build our lives. Let's ask the Lord to help us be more trusting in God and more obedient to his will and not trying to change the faith around to fit ourselves, but to realize God is the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. We are joyful. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing for joy. That's Psalm 100, just a five songs along. That's the psalm I picked when, a couple of years ago when I was ordained a priest. I picked that as the motto for my, my life in the priesthood. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy. Because the faith that is sad or mad and not glad is bad. An old priest at the seminary I went to used to say that. He was, I only met him in his coffin. I, my first week in the seminary he died and so I was there at his funeral. I was amazed at all the people who showed up for it and I began to realize he was a very holy man. He said, the faith that is sad or mad and not glad is bad. And that's a lot of wisdom in that, you know? Our, that doesn't mean we have to be always like kind of putting on a phony, oh, hi, how are you? You know, that, that's, that's, that's superficial. And some days, you know, you may feel good. Some days you may not feel so good. That's irrelevant. What, we're, what it is here, the joy is deep. It is based not upon our emotions, our subjective feeling of the moment, it is based upon our encounter with the living God. And that allows us to be joyful in the midst of great suffering. Mother Teresa used to screen her applicants for a very difficult mission of serving the poorest of the poor. If she found a, a novice who wasn't joyful, she told her to go home because she couldn't do this difficult work. You have to have that deep joy based upon the Lord. And only that will give us the ability as well to reach out to the world. It's so often, I think, with people, if you ever look on Catholic Twitter, oh my gosh, it's not exactly coming out our joy to the Lord. See how these Christians slice one another. This is not the way to be. That doesn't mean we're supposed to be kind of naive. I mean, the, the problems we're facing are incredible, obviously. But, and it's not no occasion for happy, kind of happy, clappy stuff. But their deep inner joy comes from the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let's do a little examination of conscience now. Have I rooted my life? in the Lord who is the rock of our salvation, so that I'm able to live with a serene trust, not in myself, but in the Lord, so that I'm able to have that inner deep joy, that serenity based upon a faith and a vision of God. To find that, we need to go close to God, to the rock of our salvation. O oh Lord, forgive us, forgive each one of us for the times we have become too absorbed in our own selves and have lost that evangelical joy of the good news of salvation.
With the world uh, ripped apart by such evil, which is our mission, you know, I think in somewhere in the Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo bemoans being in this world where Sauron, the great force of evil, is on the move again and orcs are attacking and all these horrible things. He wished he would lived in a different time. And I think Gandalf says, well, <laughs> that's probably true, but we're in the time we're in. So, you know, we're, God puts us where he puts us. As my dad used to say, do the best you can with what you got where you are. So this is where God put us, not somewhere else. So we better, here we're here to serve. That's why the divine office is such a help for all of us, not just the priests. Believe me, for all of us. And the Psalms, these are real prayers. There's nothing kind of treacly and gooey about them. So we're making, we're to be joyful. Why? In the midst of horror and the world going to hell in a handbasket, why are we to be joyful? For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all the gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his. The sea is his, for he made it, for his hands formed the dry land. Think of the hand, the image of hand for God. Very often you see that as a, a symbol of divine providence, a symbol of the Heavenly Father. Remember I see a crucifix once where you had the dove as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, a hand, the symbol of God the Father, and then our Lord on the cross. The hand that lifts us up, and we'll see this, I think, in, I think we're going to be praying Psalm 32. The hand that rebukes us, the hand that presses upon us to bring us to repentance, the hand that shapes creation, the creative hand of God, the life-giving hand, supportive hand of God. That's why we sing songs of praise, because God is. I am who I am. That's who he is. He's not someone we kind of use to kind of pump up a spirit or something. You can get that with all kinds of things. That's not the real thing. All other kinds of rejoicing end with a hangover. But not this. This is deep. This is lifelong. It is based upon the divine indicative. We rejoice, we celebrate because God is. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the great God, the great king above all gods. And later we see this coming down through time to our great celebration of Christ the king, the king of the universe. We see the imagery of the apocalypse. We see the majesty of that. And so, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. He's not only the force, like the force be with you or something. He's not just a force in nature. You know, the Babylonians uh, dancing on top of their little temples would be worshiping nature. And I think we've kind of gone back there again, some, you know, worshiping. Remember, St. Francis didn't say, glory be uh, to brother, son, and sister moon. He said, glory be to God for brother, son, and sister moon. We don't worship nature. We're not pantheists. I often think they must be involved in a kitchen show because they're worshiping pans. We're not pantheists. We kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. So he shapes us, he's our Lord. He is our maker, he is our rock, he is our king, he is our shepherd. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And he's not just the force, he is our God. We love him, he speaks to us, we speak to him. He is the Lord who loves us as persons, not little blobs of plasma or something. And we don't love him as electricity or something. He is the whole reality of personhood. 
And that's important for us to love one another, too. Not as objects, but as persons. A who, not a what. God is who, not just what. Huh? And so, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And that ends the first movement of this psalm. Rejoicing, exuberant, flinging ourselves before the Lord. That's why when we worship, we use candles and gold tabernacles and vestments and music and song and incense, smelling and hearing. I always like to clinkety-clink the chain to get sound as well. We worship in tokens of physical rejoicing because we're human, and God loves us that way. And he doesn't want us to offer him little pinches of worship. And that's true as well in the commitments we make in our life. We fling before the Lord an extravagant abandon in Psalm 95. And we're meant to do that in the commitments we make, in baptism, in confirmation, in marriage, religious profession, in ordination. We're not there just to sort of offer the Lord a little bit. This is exuberant, extravagant, magnificent gift of self. That's another reason it's good to pray this psalm the first thing every morning. That's the reality of marriage. It's the reality of consecrated virginity in the service of Christ the King. And when any of those great commitments are lived in a piddling way, in a anemic way, when the fire dies down and goes out, then we are in deep trouble. We need doesn't mean we have to be jumping around like the beginning of the psalm, but we need to have it deep and strong. But there's something else. It's not enough just to say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart and mind and soul. It's, oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Just like Benedict says at the beginning of the rule of Benedict. It's a good idea, by the way, to re read a little bit of the rule of Benedict every day, the way the monks do. You can get a little booklet that's got the thing for the day. The first words are, listen, my son, listen. Or in the Jewish, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Obedire, obey, means listen and act accordingly. Not enough to praise you. I praise you, Lord, if we're not actually putting it into practice. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your heart, says that Meribah as on that day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. He just said, hit the rock and the water will come. And Moses didn't trust him. He wanted to make it happen by his own effort. Kept whacking away. He didn't trust in God. Don't be like that. As we begin the day, let's put our trust in the Lord. For 40 years I was wearied of that generation. And I said, they are people who err in heart. They do not regard my ways. So sad. In the Old Testament, the, the desert journey, the people there are just wandering and mumbling and grumbling. They are people, they do not regard my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, they shall not enter my rest. We're heading not for rest in the sense of uh, doing nothing. It's the promised land. It's the heavenly city, Jerusalem. Manuha, it's the, it's the paradise, the act of reality. It's paradiso. It's not, uh, you know, be, nothing be more boring than sitting on a cloud twanging a harp. I, nothing against harps, but I think that would, that's not what, heaven is. That's not what the rest is. It's that shalom at the heart of God. It is the love that moves the sun and all the stars. That's the rest. And that's what we're called to. Oh, this psalm is so good. 
And every day we begin the day with this psalm in the divine office. And there are 149 more. It pulls a whole bunch of canticles. So this is beautiful. So I'll end off with praying the psalm again, but this time I'm going to use the other translation. You'll notice the same psalm, but it's just, this is the one I must admit. I well, This is the one that's in the bravery. So you'll notice a few differences, but not a lot. And what does this say to my head? That I may know the Lord. To my heart, that I may love the Lord. To my hands, that I may, oh, that today you would listen to his voice. I may do the right thing. Come, ring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks. With songs, let us hail the Lord. Almighty God is the Lord, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his. To him belongs the sea, for he made it, and the dry land shaped by his hands. Come in, let us bow and bend low. Let us kneel before the God who made us. For he is our God and we, the people who belong to his pasture, the flock that is led by his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the desert, when your fathers put me to the test, when they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was weary to these people, and I said their hearts are astray. These people do not know my ways. Then I took an oath in my anger, Never shall they enter my rest. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.